Really, uh, quite a fascinating time to be able to talk after the, the presentation we just heard, which is the first uh, human gene uh, editing trial in a rare disease, and it's really a, certainly a landmark. And so I'm excited now to tell you about some of the new things NIH is doing to really accelerate um, genome editing into the clinic, and this is something that Dr. Collins mentioned briefly. How do I advance the slide? How do I advance? Okay, and so this, this program is, uh, that we're going to be talking about is funded through the NIH Common Fund, which was established as part of the NIH Roadmap, and um, it, it exists now within the office of the NIH Director, and it's designed to provide a dedicated source of funding to enable trans-NIH research. And so the criteria for programs that are funded by the Common Fund are indicated here. Uh, they should be transformative with a high potential to dramatically affect biomedical and behavioral research in the next decade, uh, catalytic, synergistic, and importantly, cross-cutting um, programs are going to cut across the missions of multiple NIH institutes and centers and to be relevant to many diseases and sufficiently complex to require a coordinated trans-NIH approach and ultimately also be unique, something that no other entity is likely or able to do. And certainly accelerating uh, genome editing research into the clinic would fall into that category. And a lot of the, the impetus for this program is based in part on the, the advances in genome editing that we've heard about previously with zinc fingers, but a lot of it is also uh, stimulated by the, the CRISPR-Cas uh, technology, which is indicated here was. Um, identified in, as a breakthrough of the year by science a couple of years ago. And essentially, to kind of distinguish these two technologies and make it clear, the zinc finger approach that um, Sandy talked about involves proteins that bind to particular sequences of the DNA and make a double strand break, um, allowing other DNA sequences to put in there. And the CRISPR-Cas9 approach does somewhat the same thing. It also involves being a double-strand break. But a key difference is that the targeting process in the zinc fingers actually involves the protein. So if you need to make a new uh, enzyme, you need to make a new protein, whereas the targeting within the genome in the CRISPR-Cas9 process involves RNA molecules that are be, can be chemically synthesized, and that's, that's quite a bit more efficient. And when you think about the sheer number of rare diseases we're trying to treat, and not only the number of rare diseases, but the fact that different patients with those rare diseases are going to have different mutations. This ability, this, this uh, programmability of using RNA to direct the enzyme to the genome could be particularly salient. Um, and the other, I think, important advance in the, in the CRISPR-Cas9 field that's come around fairly recently is this concept of DNA base editors. For a lot of rare genetic diseases, the, the actual cause is a single base mutation, one base wrong out of the three billion or so in our genome that caused the disease. And wouldn't it be great if you could actually go into the genome and just correct that one base and, and, and fix it and do so without actually cutting the DNA and making a double strand break. And that's what some of these base editors are now able to do. This is the work of David Liu at Harvard and his colleagues. And essentially what they do is they take they, the, the Cas9 enzyme and the guide RNAs to direct uh, really a, a DNA repair entity to a key to the region of the, of the base that you want to change. And that carries out a DNA repair reaction that ultimately leads to correcting, in this case, a, an AT to a GC base pair. Um, and these base editors don't correct all the different kinds of mutations. They correct what are called transitions. But in fact, transition mutations are amongst the most common human disease-causing mutations, the single base mutations, accounting for well over half of the, the human disease-causing mutations that are known. So this is a particularly exciting technology, again, for these very, very rare genetic diseases and almost personalized medicine that we're talking about. So thinking about all this, the NIH decided this is a real opportunity for the Common Fund, and we did what we often do at the beginning of such an effort, which is get a, a planning group together to get the stakeholders in and, and tell us what the needs of the community are. And we had this workshop in uh, July of 2017. 
We had in scientists, investigators from both within the NIH intramural program and many from outside. Uh, we had the FDA there. We had representatives from the industry, uh, the genome editing industry, which is obviously becoming very big. And importantly, though, as always we, we like to do is get the voice of the patient involved. Uh, and we had Ron Bartek there from NORD to sort of kick off the, the program and, and, and frame the issue. Uh, and of course, Ron's here today as he always is. And some of the gaps that the groups define, the major gaps are, are the need for relevant human animal model systems for testing, cell and tissue specific delivery systems, which has come up several times already, uh, better error free editing machinery, nuclease alternatives, assays for measuring off target effects, and long term assays. And so, armed with that information, uh, those of us NIH got together and, and did what we do, which is develop funding opportunities that have now been out on the street for, as we say, for about a month. Uh, and I can tell you from my own personal experience, my email inbox, that they're getting no shortage of interest from the community uh, all around. And my colleagues are telling me the same thing, which is, of course, exactly what we hope. And so here are some of the goals, and, and one of the first is this is really improving the in vivo delivering of genome editing material. Um, obviously, a very important topic. We can get to the liver, but there's many other cell types we'd really like to be able to treat. We just can't get the materials there. These better animal models, they will be designed specifically for detecting genome editing to make it easy for people to, to test these systems in both small animals and large animals because ultimately we've got to get into, into human beings. Um, looking at the unintended adverse consequence of genome editing, we talked about off-target effects and of course we'll try to get those as low as possible, but we can identify those effects also by DNA sequencing, but the question sometimes is, is an, is an off-target effect clinically significant or not? And that gets into this real risk-benefit question that's so important for the FDA. And you really have to ask that question in the context of the relevant cell type, because certain genes are important in some cells and not others. So you really want uh, biological systems based on human cells where you can evaluate these, these uh, issues. Um, expanding the human genome engineering toolkit. Uh, zinc fingers are obviously in the clinic. CRISPR-Cas has a lot of potential, but perhaps there's something out there that's even better, that would work better than either one. And in that case, certainly the, those are the things we'd be interested in. This is, to be clear, this is not the NIH uh, CRISPR-Cas program, it's the NIH somatic genome editing program. And of course, you want to be able to coordinate and disseminate all the information that is developed from this program to be sure it gets out to the community so people can take advantage of it and use it. And so overall, uh, what we hope for this program is that these, these efforts will lower the barriers for new somatic genome editing therapies. And I've emphasized somatic there because this is an important point. We are focusing on somatic genome editing. We're not going to be supporting any work on uh, germline editing or, or editing in cells that could be passed on to subsequent generations. And in fact, one of the goals of the animal models is to allow us to test and be sure that the delivery systems we use are not editing the germline. And so how does this work in terms of translation and clinical trials? So this program is not going to be directly funding any clinical trials, but we certainly hope that it will be accelerating those. And here's sort of an example of how we envision that working. You can imagine, indeed, I'm sure this is the case, that there are groups of patient advocates thinking about doing gene editing for their disease. Maybe they've already identified the causative gene and they can think about that it could be edited. But they're kind of stuck because they have no way to deliver the relevant machinery to the relevant cell types that are so important in their disease. And so as our investigators are developing these tools and technologies and putting them out on, our, our, on the website for public availability. And, um, these groups can come and essentially adopt those technologies and, and get them over this gap and ultimately get into the clinic and get an IND. And not only just take the delivery systems, but in fact also utilize some of the new tools that we're developing for testing um, off-target effects. And that could also go into the ultimate evaluation of the, the risks and benefits of the therapy uh, as part of the process. And so I think the, the potential impact of this, this program, there's several of these increased access to IND enabling technologies, accelerated filings of INDs for gene editing therapies, faster approval of these editing therapies, and new therapeutic approaches for both rare and common diseases. Of course, today we're focused on rare diseases, but certainly not limited to that. 
Um, and I often think about how could you really sum this up, sum up the whole program in a way that really captures the impact. And as is so often the case, I think the best way to do it is uh, taking a quote from Dr. Francis Collins, who said that the focus of the somatic cell genome editing program is to dramatically accelerate the translation of these technologies to the clinic for treatment of as many genetic diseases as possible. And that's really essentially what it's all about and I think is a great way to end. So I'll, I'll stop there, except to thank my colleagues in the NIH working group that have really spent a lot of time doing this, uh, developing the funding opportunities, and look forward to seeing this work get to fruition. Uh, thank you for your attention. We don't have a situation where it's a single gene.